Well, hey there, UPC. How are you guys doing? I hope you're well. Um, wherever you are, whenever you are, uh, it is a privilege to be back. Um, it's a privilege to sing together. That's what we're going to do. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I want to invite you to participate, whatever that looks like for you. If that uh, looks like, you know, getting up off the couch and singing, uh, this first song moves a little bit. It might be opportunity for that. I see you there. Um, but we are going to worship together. And the, the beautiful thing about this whole streaming thing is that we get to be in our various communities and we get to sing songs and we get to lift up songs of praise and worship. Um, and, you know, I think if we were to sort of pull out and get that bird's eye view, we would see sort of all these homes and apartments and, and all these just neighborhoods lighting up across Seattle, um, singing songs of worship. So I uh, invite you to participate. Um, this whole service is about an hour, um, so, so settle in um, and let's, uh, let's kick this thing off. Let's sing this out. Arise, my soul. Remember this. He took my sin. He buried it. No longer I who live. Now Jesus lives in me. For I will. the light. No, I won't boast. No, I won't boast. But in the cross that saved my soul, all else is lost. The grip of
Come on, church, sing this out. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. And when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Oh, my God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. So I'm going to see your victory. I'm going to see your victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see your victory. I'm going to see your victory. For the battle belongs to you. You take what the enemy meant for evil Sing it out You take what the enemy meant for evil Take what the enemy meant for evil, you turn it for good, you turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, you turn it for good, you turn it for good. So I'm going to see your victory, I'm going to see your victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord, and I'm going to see your victory. I'm going to see your victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil, you turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, you turn it for good. Would you sing that out? You take what the enemy meant for evil, you turn it for good. Would you declare that today? You take what the enemy meant for evil. You turn it for good. That's what our God does. All of the broken pieces, all of the dysfunction, all of the hurt, all of the pain, all of the loss. Our God takes all of that and he brings redemption. He brings new life brings reconciliation, he brings hope, he brings healing. That's our God. 
That's who we're singing to. That's who we're singing about. And so much of what we do week in and week out is, is simply to gather together to remind each other of this truth. Because sometimes it's easy for us to forget. When we walk through our daily lives, we forget. Our God restores, our God renews, our God reconciles, our God brings hope, healing, flourishing, new, new, new. So I hope you're encouraged today. I hope you feel the loving arms of our God wherever you are, whether it's in your dorm room or in your living room, if you're in your kitchen, wherever you might be. God is there just as God is here in this room with us. And we believe that to be true. sing this out together.
Amen. Good morning, UPC kids. I'm Jennifer Kenny, and I'm here today with two of my favorite guys. Hi, I'm Carl. And I'm Jackson. These are my favorite guys because they're my sons. Hey, can you guys think of an activity that you're involved in where there might be rules or, or guidelines? Hmm. Oh, I know. What about baseball? Whoa! Carl, what happened? Well, I was thinking about how baseball has some really good rules. Hmm. Like, I only need to throw three strikes to get the batter out. Or, I need to wear a helmet when I'm batting. That keeps me safe. That's a great example. Do you think baseball would be any fun without rules? No way. The rules make the game fun, fair, and they keep all the players safe. Yeah, they, it does. Jackson, what were you thinking about? Well, I was thinking about scouts. Whoa! That's a cool uniform. Thanks. Well, can you tell me more? Well, in scouts, we have these 12 words called the scout law, like trustworthy, helpful, and brave. Hmm. How do those words help scouts, do you think? Well, they're words to live by, so they prepare scouts for life. Wow. You guys, these were both really good examples. And you know, today in our Bible story, we learn about 10 words that God gave to Moses and the people of Israel. They're called the Ten Commandments, and they're very famous. In fact, kids at home, I bet you know of one. Can you tell your parents right now? Good job. Sometimes I forget to follow the rules. I'm worried that God won't love me if I don't get them right. Hmm, Carl, I know what you mean. You know, it's really important to remember that in our story, God saved the people from slavery in Egypt first, and then he gave them these rules. And these rules, these commandments, were to help the people love God better and to love their neighbor better. Hey, this reminds me of Jesus. Oh, can you tell me a little bit more? Well, Jesus died to save us, even though we still make mistakes. And he said to love God with all our heart and love our neighbor as ourselves. He also said, this is the new commandment I give you. Yeah, that's right. That is really great news. In fact, that's the best news of all, that Jesus came to save us even though we make mistakes. To learn more about today's story, you can find it in the Bible in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. And you can go to our website, upc.org slash kids, for some great activities and more resources. Guys, thanks so much for helping me out today. This was really fun. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for saving us. Thank you for such good news that even though we make mistakes, you love us and you came to save us. And thank you for these 10 words, these 10 commandments that God gave to Moses and the people of Israel that help us love you better and our neighbor better. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks everybody, we'll see you next week. Bye. 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 Well, thank you, Jennifer, Jackson, and Carl. For that. I love the quick change, uh, you guys. That's pretty amazing. Uh, my name is Tim Snow. I'm one of the pastors here at University Presbyterian Church. And uh, I want to prepare our hearts to be able to bring our tithes and offerings. Uh, and as we do that, I want to remind you that today we have a special opportunity to support our Deacon and Disaster Fund. Uh, because of your generosity, this is a fund that can support uh, people within our own congregation who have needs and also our neighbors. One of our initiatives right now is called the Neighbor Help Initiative, and we're providing up to $300 in support for neighbors who are in need through your personal referral of them to us. Um, it could be an electric bill or a cell phone bill or food or utilities. Uh, they name it, and $300 goes to them. Another way our Deacon Fund right now is helping, they had a chance to help a family over the last month who were experiencing really the disorientation of being in stage four cancer, one of their members. And so they were able to help them financially as well. Another way is through a grant. Just this last month, we gave a grant of $10,000 to the University District Food Bank. That's in addition to our weekly food drive that we do every Sunday, and also the many volunteers from UPC who are part of uh, serving there at the food bank as well. I also want to uh, thank you for your continued uh, giving to shared offering. Uh, that's, that's what pays to run the church. Uh, I mean, your faithfulness and generosity has, has uh, allowed us to invest in things like our media and technology, which is how we're coming to you right now uh, as we bring God's uh, good news to you um, and people really all over the world. Check your the, the little chat feed and you'll see people from all over the world who tune in. Um, 
So we thank you for keeping our church financially um, strong and sound during this time. There's three ways to give. You can give online at upc.org slash give, or you can text the letters UPC to 77977, and then follow the prompts. It'll give you prompts. Or you can mail a check right to the church if you'd like as well. Well, we're going to have an opportunity to go into prayer in just a moment, but before we do that, I wanted to call out um, uh, a special recognition to Vic Scalise, who is celebrating this month the 60th anniversary of his ordained ministry. Uh, that's a great thing. There's a picture here I want to show you. Um, that's Vic and his son, Doug. Uh, so we honor you, Vic, and uh, celebrate the, God's faithfulness in your ministry over the years. Well, let's pray together. Lord, I pray that you quiet our hearts and you open our hands as we offer you our tithes and our offerings. We thank you for the, all that you have given us. Lord, we, uh, you are the, the living and you are the faithful God who wants to call us friends. You created each one of us. And through Jesus Christ, you, you bring us uh, your grace and restoration by the cross and resurrection. You bring it to each one of us. We're grateful for that, Lord. We open our lives to you, and we ask your spirit to fill us with your grace and with hope. Lord, help us to find you not in the controlling of each day, but in the places where you show up, in the face of our coworkers, in our neighbors, in our child, in a friend, in a stranger. Lord, help us to share the good news of your grace with our neighbors. And Lord, we, we pray for our world. We pray for justice in our country, that racism is upended, and change would occur in the hearts and the systems that need to be transformed, that all would value justice and honor for all. Lord, we, we, uh, as we walk through this pandemic, we pray that you'd help, keep each, help us keep each other safe. We pray for frontline workers, essential workers, and for those particularly vulnerable during this COVID time. Uh, keep them safe, Lord, encourage each one. Give them a sense of joy in the midst of this too. Lord, for those looking for work, unemployment's high and people are losing their jobs. And Lord, we pray for uh, the right connections for people and opportunities for those seeking work. We, we pray that you would use their gifts and use their hearts in these new opportunities. And Lord, we pray for those who are um, facing sickness or physical illness or challenge. We pray for healing. We pray for hope. We pray for specifically for people that come to our hearts, for Kevin, for Bob Aiken, for Bob Brannigan, for CS, for, for Dave's dad, Richard, and, and others who come to mind right now. May they know your healing in, physic, in their physical bodies, Lord, in their, in their hearts, in their, in their minds as well. Lord, they, may they know your care, your mercy as they walk through these challenges. Lord, we pray for those who are trying to stay close as they care for loved ones in the hospital and nursing facilities and retirement communities. I mean, so much is distanced right now as we try to care. So Lord, help us to be creative. Help us to make contact. Help us to share love with those who are isolated from us. And we pray, Lord, for those who are grieving, who have lost uh, loved ones recently. Lord, help them to know your mercy and hope. Remind all all of us of the hope of your resurrection, that even with the darkness of death, it does not have the final word. You have the hope we, we count on, Lord. And now, Lord, we pray that you continue to help us to pray as we pray the prayer you taught with. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Good morning, friend. My name is George Hinman, and I want to invite you to take out your Bible and open up to Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 through 17. This is where we find the 10 commandments, as they're usually called, or 10 words, as the Bible itself actually refers to them, 10 matters. We're looking at these 10 things as followers of Jesus. And with each of them, we've been working hard to try to look behind the commandment and see what's the gift? 
that God is trying to give his people and, and us as his people today. So it, we've come today to the seventh word, and uh, we'll read it together if you choose to join me. It's very brief, so you've got to be quick, but uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. So just look down to verse 14 there, and uh, we'll read together. Listen carefully. You're reading God's holy word. You shall not commit adultery. This is the word of the Lord. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord lasts forever. Lord Jesus, you are the living word. You're present to us. You're the one who makes us present to one another. Speak, would you? Speak for your servants are listening. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bring this word to life in us. For your sake and in your name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, Caitlin Beatty is a single 34-year-old woman who wrote an article not long ago in the New York Times. Interesting article. It's about sexuality and a theology of sexuality. And she writes this. She says, I yearn for guidance on how to integrate faith and sexuality. Kind of a plea um, for thoughtful people to just move beyond the permissions and prohibitions to a, a, a positive understanding of what human sexuality is all about and the sacredness of this gift. She raised some really good questions for me. Um, And as I'm studying this text this week, I'm realizing, oh my goodness, the seventh word really points us in the direction that she's looking. The seventh word exists to protect the sanctity of marriage. But, um, But behind it, there's this gift of sexual wholeness. And that's a gift for all of us, no matter who we are. I mean, whether we're single or married, whether we're young or old, uh, widowed, divorced, prudes and prodigals, all of us, the gift of sexual wholeness. So I thought, well, what would I say uh, to Caitlin if I just had a few minutes to talk with her about it? I'd like to kind of share my response to Caitlin with you. And uh, she says, you know, 34 years old, no husband has come along. I've tried to live with the sexual ethic that I was raised with, but I've struggled with that and haven't always. So what would we say to Caitlin? What would you say to Caitlin? Well, I would want her to know about what I call the double embrace. Um, The double embrace. Let let me ask you to use your imagination. To have faith, you always have to use your imagination. So just picture in your mind this image. Two persons embracing one another. Would you imagine that? Not, not a husband and a wife, not, not two adulterers, two persons. In fact, imagine that these are God, that this is God in two persons. That what you have in, in this image is God the Father embracing God the Son in love, in intimacy. If you have that, what you have is God embracing humanity and humanity embracing God. So I think, Caitlin, for you the question is, can you see yourself inside that embrace? If you can see yourself inside of that embrace, I'll tell you what, what it means is God meets you not in your sexual brokenness, but in the sexual wholeness of his perfect son, Jesus Christ. And it means no matter what your sexual experience, there's always a greater intimacy available to you in an experience of Jesus. So I'll loop back around in a moment to the double embrace, but that's, that's the double embrace right there. And the question really is, do we see ourselves in that embrace? Because that, that's the only place I'm aware of where we can really fully receive the gift of sexual wholeness the sexual wholeness that's implicit behind the seventh word, the double embrace. But what I'd like to do before returning to that is I want to share two implications of the seventh word, Um, two surprises, I think, for us about sex. And and one is that sex is, um, it's way bigger than the culture tells us. And the other is that sex is much less than the culture tells us. So let's take those in turn. First of all, way bigger. What I'd like to to, to communicate is that sex is much more powerful than the culture tells us because it seals a bond 
of souls. A bond of souls. Let's go back to the commandment again. Uh, the Lord says to Israel, you shall not commit adultery. Now, the reason for that is when you're messing around with your bodies, you're not just messing around with your bodies, you're messing around with your souls. Notice how the seventh commandment proceeds from the sixth commandment. We, we looked at the sixth last week, and we learned there, particularly when we read Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, that you and I are made in the image of God. All, all people are, which means we're not just bodies. We're not just physical. We're spiritual beings. We're embodied souls. And, and see, this is now being carried into the seventh commandment. When there is sexual intimacy, there is spiritual intimacy. And it's important for us to realize that because the culture does not tell us that. In the culture, uh, we think of sex as just a kind of another gym machine or like a yoga pose between two people. It's just physical. Uh, output leads to input. Input leads to output. It's physical stimulation. It's nothing more than that. No emotion, no spirituality. Mark Edmondson, his faculty at the University of Washington, writes, <clears throat> hooking up is a fantasy of frictionless sex, sex free of deep emotion. Uh, hooking up is sex that lets you keep on sliding over surfaces, moving from partner to partner as smoothly as you move from one site to another site on a laptop, as though there weren't any emotion and you couldn't get hurt, and there's, it's just physical. But that's not the case. It doesn't work that way. This is not true uh, physiologically. Physiologically. Now those of you who are biologists are telling us that actually there's a deep bond that gets formed in our brains around uh, sexual intimacy. Patricia Wirakun, by the way, a Sri Lankan uh, lecturer from the University of Sydney in Australia, she says sexual intimacy bonds a couple at the brain level. In other words, sex provokes a kind of a brain bath of hormones uh, that wash over us, the cuddle hormones, oxytocin, vasopressin, and these reinforce a bond and they change the chemistry of our brain to draw us closer to this individual. And it's not just a physical bond. The Bible tells us that it's a spiritual bond as well. For example, let me show you two passages. First, Malachi chapter 2, verse 14. Here's a text that uses the word covenant, a really rich concept in uh, Israel life. We read, the Lord has a witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you've been faithless, though she's your companion, and your wife by covenant. See that? Your, she's your wife. Notice, the Lord is between the two of you, and she's your wife by covenant. What this text is telling us is that uh, marriage is a covenant, and sex is the sign of that covenant. And a covenant, uh, to the Hebrew mind, is always a relationship between three parties, not two. A husband, a wife, and the Lord, pulling those two together, making a bond, sealing a bond between their two souls. And, and then the other passage is 1 Corinthians 6, verse 16. This tells us that the bond is formed by sex, the sign of, of the covenant, even when the marriage isn't present. So here Paul is talking about prostitution. He says, do you not know that whenever whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body, body with her? For it is said, the Lord shall be one flesh. Now that's a reference to Genesis chapter 2 that's describing this body and soul unity. Uh, and then he, he, just to make sure we, we get it that this is a spiritual union, he adds in verse 19, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So to be joined physically with a prostitute is to be joined spiritually and your soul somehow become linked whether that's your intention or not. And this is why... C.S. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity, the truth is that wherever a man lies with a woman, there, whether they like it or not, a transcendental relation is set up between them, which must be eternally enjoyed or eternally endured. A transcendental relation. I mean, that's really interesting. And, and, and it, what, what this is all saying is there's a real gift here. This is a gift, actually, that, that your soul is bound to another soul through sexual intimacy. It's meant to strengthen an, a marriage, which is what the seventh word is protecting, a marriage. 
And that's why sex always belongs exclusively within the bond of a lifelong commitment. You want to protect that spiritual bond. This is, by the way, what the seventh word is all about. This is what all the words are about. I told you earlier, uh, the, these are not like the law of the stop sign. They're like the law of the fire, which is Dorothy Sayers' uh, language. You know, you, you can change the law of the stop sign by legislative action, but you try to do that with the fire. The first legislator that walks out and puts their hand in the fire get, gets burned. Uh, these are laws like gravity or thermodynamics. You can't change them. This is why... Proverbs 6, 27 says, can a man embrace fire and his clothes not be burned? And the context there is adultery. And the answer is, is no. And, and some of us have an experience of that. If, if you've had a, a, spiritual, a, a sexual relationship with someone, uh, this is why it's hard to break up after that union um, because there's been a bond that's been formed. And you're not just losing a partner, you're losing a part of yourself. Your soul is diminished by that. And there's deep pain associated with that. This is also why some of us tend to stay in relationships too long. The relationship and the, the, the emotional intimacy of the relationship may have died long ago. What's keeping the relationship together? Sexual intimacy. It's kind of gluing a couple together. And you don't, you don't want that. You, you want your relationship to be built on uh, emotional intimacy and relational intimacy. And unfortunately, when the sex is all that's sustaining the relationship, what, what happens is you lose the incentive that you need to do the hard work of building relational intimacy, the work of curiosity or communi communication, uh, the work of serving one another and celebrating each other, uh, the work of vulnerability and forgiveness. So we want to think about our souls when we think about sex. Right? Um, <laughs> when you're thinking about engaging sexually with someone, you want to ask yourself, do I really want a, what Lewis calls a transcendental relationship with this person? And you go, well, that changes things. I'm not even sure I want lunch with them, let alone uh, 60 years of marriage. But we should think about that because that's what happens, whether we like it or not, when we're sexually engaging with somebody. There's a bond of the souls. In every physical embrace, there's a spiritual embrace, if it's sexual. And that's powerful, and that's way bigger than the culture tells us. So this is what I would say. I would try to get across to Caitlin. I would say, Caitlin, I want you to think about this bond, spiritual bond, that's what makes it sacred. I want you to think about it in the context of the double embrace. Let's come back to that. Think about the soul your soul in the double embrace. Do you cherish your soul as God cherishes your soul? See, in that embrace, God is not asking you about your sexual brokenness, not asking you about your sexual history, not asking you about who you've been with, who you're with now, or who you're not with. He's trying to give you a gift, trying to give you the gift of sexual wholeness for you. And in that moment, you're, you're caught in an embrace between the father and the son where there's nothing but delight and joy and love. And it's in this place that you can be restored sexually, that all of us are meant to be restored sexually. And it's in this place that we find an intimacy that is far greater than anything we have ever or can ever find in physical sexuality. Which brings us to the second implication. Okay, not just way bigger. Secondly, much smaller. Sex is much smaller than the culture tells us. Because our souls find a much, much deeper intimacy in a bond with Jesus. A bond with Jesus. Back to the text. You shall not commit adultery. Now remember who heard these words and where they were. Um, you, you can't commit adultery and just hurt yourself. Uh, this is not about consent between two parties. You're going to hurt a whole lot of other people. And at the foot of Sinai, the people who first hear this command, they're being formed into a spiritual community. I mean, these 10 words, they're not just about sex. They're not even primarily about sex. They're about a spiritual community 
right? Listen to the language at the heading of the Ten Commandments. You can look at that if you still have it open. I am the Lord, your God. That's covenant language. You are mine, it says. And then if you go back a, a paragraph or two, you get to Exodus 19, and you read this beautiful, intimate language where the Lord says, I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. You are my treasured possession. This is metaphorical language of intimacy, uh, the covenant bond. It's, I've have, I want to have it with you, the Lord says. Uh, there's a picture of a, of a mother eagle with her fledgling flying on her back. We see this in Seattle, carrying her on eagle's wings. There's an image of a, of a treasured possession like cherished lovers who are deep embraced. And the, and the Lord's speaking of intimacy with him that he's inviting this community, Israel, into in that moment. See, there's a greater intimacy. But our culture doesn't understand this. I mean, we, you know, we can be forgiven until God encounters us, thinking that sex maybe is the greatest fulfillment or experience of intimacy. But we're here to say it's not. I mean, the culture says there's almost nothing greater than sex, right? We get this message subliminally a thousand times every day in so many ways. That, that sex is the deepest form of intimacy, that you're not wanted until you're sexy, and that if you really want a fulfillment in life, then you've got to find a sex partner, and it's got to be really good, right? It's the pressure that the culture puts on us. Ernest Becker, in his classic, The Denial of Death, said this is just what's going to happen when you displace God from where he belongs. When we reject God, the only way to, place to turn to is what he calls the romantic solution. And he writes in The Denial of Death, the love partner becomes the divine ideal within which to fulfill one's life. We look to the love partner for fulfillment. But ultimately, he argues, this becomes, quote, a disappointing answer to life's riddle. Because if your partner is your all, then any shortcoming in him becomes a major threat to you. That's Ernest Becker. That's interesting. He's raising the question, do we really want to think this way about sex as though it's ultimate, as though it has the power to fulfill us and this alone? I mean, is, could that even be true? If you just think about it, how many people are actually sexually active? I mean, at any given time, most of us are not. And, and if you had to have sex to have fulfillment, what would this say about children or singles or uh, couple, couples, married couples who, who don't have fulfilling sexual experience or uh, people who have had trauma or abuse, um, widows, elderly, people who are not capable of sex. Are we saying you're not capable of fulfillment? No, of course not. That's not the message. The Bible offers us so much more. See, the Bible says that actually there are two ways of experiencing the, the one body flesh that we read about in Genesis 2. There are two ways. And one is just a dim reflection of the other. And one is for some, but the other is for all. And what it all points to is intimacy with Jesus. Intimacy with Jesus is the deepest and greatest intimacy that human beings can enjoy. So we get a picture of this. Two more verses about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. Paul writes, do you know, do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her. For it is said, and here he quotes Genesis, the two shall become one flesh, body and soul. And, then, and, uh, and, and he says, then he's talking about uh, marriage, physical, literal marriage, um, but it points to spiritual uh, bond with Jesus. He says, this is a great mystery, and I'm applying it to Christ and the church. I'm sorry, I put the wrong, I, I meant to put up there 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. <laughs> it's, um, and he's, so the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? That's the one I wanted. So you see, what he's saying is when you come to the communion table, there's a sharing in the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. There's this one flesh un union with Jesus and with the people who join with you at the table. And then Ephesians 5, 32, where he's also citing uh, the two will become one flesh. But he says, I'm not talking about husband and wife here. He says, this is a great ministry, and I'm applying it to Christ and the church. He's saying, yeah, marriage is awesome. But what it does is it points to a greater reality that is for all of us, a union between Christ and the church, that intimacy, that bond. 
So in other words, the greatest symbol of, of true interest, intimacy isn't a bed, like the culture tells us, it's a table, a communion table, like Jesus tells us. I learned this recently. Did you know that you know, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus talks about the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery, he uses the word lust, it, it, even when you lust after another person. But when he talks about communion, he uses the same word. In um, Luke twenty two fifteen, he says to his disciples, I have eagerly desired, that's the same word, to eat this Passover with you. This is the first communion experience. He's saying, oh man, I lust to share this meal with you. The word lust, that, that word really means just deep, deep, deep passion. Jesus has this yearning to meet his disciples at the table because he wants to be intimate with them for his sake as well as for theirs. Interesting passage. This is the deepest intimacy. So if you can't be fulfilled without sex, think about Jesus. He was single. He never had sex. He, he lived the most fulfilling life of any human being that ever walked the face of this earth. He's the embodiment of human wholeness, right? What does this mean for us then and the yearning that we all experience as part of our sexuality? It means that the yearning isn't ultimately for a physical experience with a, a mate, it's for a spiritual experience with God and Jesus Christ. It means that we are called to build intimacy with Jesus first and foremost. The goal of life isn't marriage. <laughs> the goal of life isn't sex. The goal of life is Jesus. This is why Jesus tells us that in heaven there will be no marriage because why would you need the sign when you have the thing that is signified, the reality, intimacy with God. Our human sexuality has been built into us by God to be fulfilled by God alone. By the way, this is what liberated women in the early church because they were no longer defined by their relationship to men. By the way, this is what sustained chastity for singles in the early church because they were finding intimacy with Jesus and intimacy with other Christ followers in that community. By the way, this is what transformed sexual minorities. Jackie Hill Perry writes that heterosexuality is not a fruit of the Spirit. It's not the goal, neither is uh, heterosexual marriage, it's not the goal, but what is a fruit of the Spirit? Self-control. And we all need that and we receive that from Jesus. By the way, this is what healed and strengthened marriages in the early church. The very thing that the seventh word was meant to protect, as it turns out, when you make Jesus your source of, source of intimacy, you're not constantly trying to beg it out of your, your partner and you don't have the temptation to turn them into a God. The romantic solution that Becker talks about. So we build this intimacy with Jesus and we build this intimacy in Jesus with one another in a spiritual community called the church. We wanna be this church. And for, for me, this is what's so special about UPC. I mean, we're this family of people that were young and old, we're single and married, we're divorced and recovering, uh, we're gay and we're straight, we're prudes and we're prods, we're believers and we're not yet believers. And I'm glad, I'm glad for all of that. I mean, you may not believe what the Bible believes about so many things. You may not believe what we believe, but you honor us with your presence in our, command, in our family, in our community. And I just wanna say there's a place for you. There's a place for you here, thank you. Because here, Family is not defined by sex. It's defined by Jesus. It's defined by intimacy with him that he shares with us and that we share with one another. And that transforms us. So the seventh word teaches us that sex is way bigger than we think and compared to the intimacy we have in Jesus, it's much, much smaller than we think. So coming back to Caitlin, I would say before you embrace another let Jesus embrace you. I, I guess if you go home with anything, or you're already at home, if you stay at home with anything today, it's, it's that. Before you embrace another, let Jesus embrace you. I don't know, Caitlin, if she'll find a husband someday, but if she ever does, I, I would want her to let that relationship be an expression of the double embrace. You, you know, a union, a bond of two souls together with a third, the soul of Jesus. 
If a husband comes, that's what it should be. But why wait? You're in the double embrace right now. Today, your true lover kneels before you. You have no need of another. Someday you'll see his face. Someday you will feel the touch of his embrace around your body. And if today you need a little bit of an experience of that, then I want to invite you to join us around the communion table. Pull up and let's together be the arms of Jesus Christ in an intimate community that experiences him. I want to close by telling you about a sculpture. It's a, a sculpture that I would say depicts the double embrace. It, it was in Scotland uh, near Edinburgh. The artist who made the sculpture did not know what to do with his sexuality until he found himself in the embrace of Jesus Christ. The sculpture shows uh, two men who are embracing each other, arms around, heads on each other's shoulders. They're identical men when you look closely, except for one thing, the hands. The hands of one man have nail scars. And of course, then you realize, oh, this is Jesus. The idea for this sculpture comes from Romans chapter 5, where the Apostle Paul is talking about the two Adams. He's describing Jesus as the second Adam who's come to reverse all the damage that the first Adam has done to himself and to creation to, and to all of his uh, offspring. He's talking about the one man's obedience, the obedience of Jesus Christ, the second Adam who does this reversal. The fancy word theologically is called recapitulation. Listen to what Romans 5.19 says, for just as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, that's Jesus, the second Adam, the many will be made righteous. So in other words, this man is seeing himself in the double embrace. Because if you look at the two figures, you realize one's Jesus and the other one is this man, now whole, now being healed by Jesus. This is what happens when we get caught up into the double embrace. The work of the second Adam on our behalf gives us his healing, the healing that's only available between the Father and the Son. Friend, now, I don't want to miss an opportunity before we go to invite you to join the double embrace. You are invited. Jesus says to all of us, this is my body which is given for you. This is my blood which is shed for you. It's an invitation to come into the covenant bond that he has come to make, bonding your soul to his for all of eternity. He doesn't just come for, for uh, righteous people. He comes for sinners, he tells us, like me and, and maybe like you. Comes to catch us at our worst, to invite us into his best. But the gift, if you choose to receive it, is to be made righteous in him not by our works, but by his works. And we receive it as a simple act of faith to say, I trust that this gift is now mine because you desire to give it to me. It's like coming before an altar in a church and saying, I do, but only you're saying it to the God of the universe. I do, not I did or didn't do, not I can, not I will, not I know, but I do. I do receive the gift of the second Adam. I do see myself in the double embrace by faith. Now, the moment you say that, let me tell you what happens. The Father and the Son send forth from their embrace a third person in the Trinity who's also God, the Holy Spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit do? Immediately, he creates the bond between your soul and the soul of Jesus. And then immediately, he releases the intimacy of the double bond, that embrace, into your life. And this is where the healing and transformation begin. Friend, I encourage you, I urge you out of affection to turn to Jesus today and say to him, I do. If you'd be willing to consider that, I would invite you to come to our website to upc.org slash Jesus. Read a little bit there about what it means to to receive this gift, and then click through because right now we have people who are available to you. would love to talk with you a little bit, hear your story, share the story of Jesus with you, and give you confidence 
that you belong to him today. And for the rest of us, let's take this time to pray. Would you bow with me? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what a beautiful story. And it's the only story that is as true as true can be. That you have opened up this circle of love, that you have come to draw us into it without condemnation, but with delight and celebration and joy, releasing transformation into our lives and make us, making us agents of change for those around us. We want to receive this gift today, we pray. Would you renew and refresh us in the arms of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. So come now in power and let our chains be broken. Pour out your spirit, Jesus, our hearts they're open. Come now in power and let our chains be broken. Pour out your spirit, Jesus, our hearts they're open. chains be broken, pour out your spirit, Jesus, our hearts, they're open. Are you hurting? is calling you. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling you. So come to the altar the Father are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious Precious blood of Jesus Christ. Let's sing, oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? And oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Wonderful. Sing Alleluia. Christ is risen. Sing that again. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing Alleluia. Christ is risen. Declare it today. And oh, what a Savior! Isn't He wonderful? Sing Alleluia! Christ is risen. So 
come now in power and let our chains be broken pour out your spirit jesus our hearts they're open come now in power and let our chains be broken pour out your spirit jesus our hearts they're open Amen. You know, it's just the way the Holy Spirit works. I didn't know Zawadi was going to close with that song, Come to the Altar, and he did not know that I was going to close my sermon the way I did, inviting us to say, I do. And I just feel like it indicates the Holy Spirit is doing something. I don't know what it is, but I'm pleased to be a part of it, and I'm pleased that you're a part of it, too. I want to thank you for sharing this hour of worship with us. It's been a gift. Um, if you have a sense that maybe this is the moment to really take Jesus seriously and take a, another step closer to him, I, I just would urge you to listen to that. Please do come back to our website, upc.org slash Jesus, and take a moment to talk to somebody about that. Thank you for your generosity. You know, I, to see this community worshiping Jesus with your wallets as a way of expressing love for him and sharing hope with the people in our neighbors, neighborhoods near and far. It's just meant so much to me, and I want to thank you for doing that. I know that not everybody can give right now, but so many of you have been generous, and if you can, I just want to encourage you to continue to do that, to excel still more. Take a moment before you leave this live stream to make a contribution if that's your intention. And beyond that, I, I say, you know, we have a charge to go out and pursue intimacy with Jesus and intimacy with, uh, within his church, this fellowship of people touched by him and embraced by him. If you want to know what that might look like practically, I, I, I could suggest, you know, you might read a psalm today, and I, I'd recommend Psalm 16. Read it with an awareness that Jesus is by your side as you do. If you want intimacy with the church, would you reach out to a friend who's also a believer and say, could we pray together, just on the phone maybe, or as you walk uh, outside wearing masks to keep one another safe. But wherever you go and whatever you do, know that he is with you. And uh, hear this benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And all God's people said, amen. Hey church, it was so good to gather together and to be the body of Christ online. Let's remember church doesn't stop here, but church continues as we join Jesus on his mission to reconcile all people. And here are a few ways to get involved and to be able to be equipped to live out and to be the church that God has called us to be. Good morning, church family. I'm Debbie Simons, the Early Childhood Associate Director here at UPC. I have a special announcement for families with UPC kids. Picture a Christmas workshop right here in Northeast Seattle. Our children's staff and some of our amazing volunteers have been busy designing and assembling Advent kits for you. We're doing the planning and the legwork, compiling ideas, materials, and supplies to help you and your family celebrate the Advent season as a gift to you. In the kit, you'll find things such as a devotional, materials to make an advent chain with scripture on it, banner flags with original artwork from one of our UPC congregants that tells the Christmas story and more. You'll find something for kids of all ages to enjoy in the kit. And it's our hope and prayer that you'll experience the love of Jesus and joy this advent season as you engage with these materials together. So go to upc.org slash kids and sign up for your free Advent kit. And we will look forward to seeing you drive by UPC on Sunday, November 22nd to pick up your kit.